hello. <laughs> there are a few people in the room and many people out of the room. Uh, my name is Rael Khan. Uh, let's see if I can turn off this echo I have. Um, I'm the director of the Center for Mindfulness Science. Thank you for coming today. And thank you especially to our guest who's uh, just off the train from San Diego, Dr. Arno Delon. Um, I was thinking about how to introduce Arno uh, this morning, and uh, a few themes came to mind. Um, one is, you know, we're old friends and collaborators for many years, um, having worked on projects, uh, primarily looking at the effects of meditation on the brain, meditation of different types, um, and also for signals that may correlate to uh, the reason why people feel connected in their minds with each other. Um, and Arno has gone on and done a lot of more work along those lines using techniques like hyperscanning and um, the code recording multiple brains at the same time. Uh, but the major themes that I think uh, really are relevant to speak about with regards to Arno's career is that he's very much a pioneer and a uh, um, contributor to the uh, fund of useful knowledge for the neuroscience community in regards to uh, analyzing brain, sig brain signals. Um, he uh, was the primary mover and force behind the programming of a software called EEG Lab, which is the most used software in the world for uh, studying EEG, analyzing EEG using uh, numerous mathematical approaches. Um, and um, outside of that more technical side of his work, he's also very adventurous, adventurous in the kinds of scientific questions he's chosen to take on. Um, and just as I was trying to formulate exactly how I wanted to uh, make this intro exactly, Arno sent me a very interesting uh, text from ChatGPT, which was generated by a friend of his when his friend uh, put in, well, how, how to introduce Dr. Delorme for a, a, this talk. And I just wanted to read it out to you because it actually captures some themes that I think are very, uh, very accurate and also kind of funny. Um, okay, it's a little bit uh, conversational. Hey man, you gotta hear about this groovy cat, Arno Delorme. He's like a CNRS professor at Paul Sabatier University in Toulouse, France. But don't let the French twist your taco. He's also a research scientist over at the Swartz Center for Computational Neuroscience at UC San Diego. Plus, he's got this wild gig at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. You know, exploring the far out stuff. But that ain't all, man. Over at the Salk Institute at U and UCSD, Dr. Delorme concocted this far out EEG lab software. It's all about dialing into those brainwave vibes with EEG signals. And let me tell you, it's the bomb, man. Everyone's using it for their EEG research all around the globe. This cat's been on a crazy trip, man. He's always tweaking and fine tuning EEG lab, helping neuroscience blast off. His research is all over the map, from pure neuroscience to wrapping his head around those mathy methods. Plus, especially when it comes to EEG signals, plus he's into the whole mindfulness, mind watering, and meditation thing. So yeah, come listen to this righteous researcher expound upon what's cooking in our noggins, man. So I thought that was <laughs> provide some nice levity and also ca capture some of the themes that are important to know about uh, Arno's research over the years. So without further ado, thank you very much for coming and joining us, Arno, and uh, thank you for tuning in, whether locally or, or from afar. Thank you, Rayon, for uh, uh, this nice introduction. And thank you for inviting me to talk about the far out stuff. Even though I'm going to start, it's more a chronological uh, presentation because I start up with uh, I've always been interested in consciousness but uh, and that came about when uh, I was in uh, I think seventh grade 
in the suburbs of Paris. And um, I was in the courtyard. And before that, I wanted to be a firefighter. And uh, the thought struck me, why am I here? What am I doing here? Like I think I was like 10, 10 years old. And from that time on, because of my upbringing, you know, Western world, that meant, um, well, study the brain. You know, what else are you going to do if you want to know why you're here? You're going to study the brain. But for after my PhD, etc., we'll see, you know, where uh, that uh, uh, led to other uh, kinds of, of study that I'll talk about. But so this is what I did during my uh, PhD, neural networks. Um, and here it comes from the, um, the hypothesis that, well, just our brain just uh, uh, there is, yeah, it comes from the hypothesis that uh, consciousness to emerge magically from neural networks, which I think is still uh, the most uh, uh, believed hypothesis among neuroscientists. But basically, you know, it's in these neural networks, which were connectionist neural networks, exact, very similar to the uh, one we're using today for image recognition, the deep learning one. This is another one here that's converging automatically to recognize shapes. And then we had uh, another one, this was after my PhD, where uh, you just showed tons of image and it learns to recognize different types of uh, object. And mainly, so this was more than 20 years ago. The main, uh, the main breakthrough in uh, learning network is uh, there is first computational power. You know, now they have much more computational power. And also somebody thought, well, you know, if, if you show 1 million image, it works well. What about 10 billion? And, you know, that's in the range where uh, it, it really became what we know of today, you know, chat GPT and uh, um, network which recognize images. But the only main difference is computational power and more layers. Uh, it was pretty much the same thing we're doing uh, in these days. And I've continued to uh, work on these kind of networks, especially when it relates to uh, EEG and uh, EEG and emotion. I'm interested in emotion. How can we use deep learning uh, neural network to study EEG and emotion? And it's not so much in building artificial uh, intelligence as much as analyzing EEG with deep learning and having deep learning find out what's different, different condition, for example, you're sad or happy, you know, what's different in your brain, where you can say, oh, let me study this brain wave, or let me study this brain wave. Well, the deep learning network is gonna zero in on what's the most, uh, what can differentiate be, uh, basically these two uh, mental states. And there's this whole uh, um, um, uh, trend, especially it was more like two years ago, is AI conscious, etc. I think most of the consciousness uh, researcher, there's no ambiguity that these AIs have uh, no consciousness uh, uh, whatsoever. And we can debate about that. Um, but um, I want to present now a um, second part of my research, which was uh, uh, centered on meditation and uh, the stream of consciousness. So William James defines the stream of consciousness as consciousness is in constant change. Now we're seeing, now hearing, now reasoning, now willing, now recollecting, now expecting, now loving, now hating, and in a hundred other ways we know our mind to be alternatively engaged. And what's interesting is that this is very similar to the way some of the Eastern mystic define um, consciousness. Uh, there is no self that stands at the mentality to which characteristics and events accrue and from which they fall away, leaving it intact at death. The stream of consciousness through, flowing through many lives is as changing as the stream of water. Uh, and uh, this is from Hamala, Hamala Wa uh, Sadatisa. Um, so we see, we see how uh, connected they are. And this refers uh, principally to when you're meditating, uh, you have all these thoughts that pop in, in your brain. Did I remember to lose my belt? It's definitely uh, getting tighter, etc. So you have all these, uh, all these thoughts that pop up in your mind. And one question is, 
Where do these thoughts come from? Why do we have uh, these thoughts? And I started to be interested in that uh, about 20 years ago. Now it's a well-recognized field in neuroscience, mind wandering, but it came from the field of, uh, of meditation. And the main reason I was interested in that is um, I was a meditator and I was mind wandering a lot. I don't know if uh, some of you are probably have meditated before and um, maybe don't mind wander as much as I do, but I thought this was an interesting uh, question to both understand why I was mind wandering during meditation and also this field was not approachable by uh, uh, neuroscience at this time. So the wandering mind. So we did several studies on to study mind wandering uh, during meditation and not during meditation. And to study mind wandering basically you have many tasks. One of the tasks is called the SART task, sustained attention response task in which I'll show you a number and maybe you have a better example after. I show you a number about uh, every two seconds and basically you have to press the space bar every single time. Every single number you see, except for number three. And if you are uh, not paying attention, basically you're gonna press the space bar all the time. So this is how we, one way to study uh, uh, mind wandering. And we observed here, so uh, periods of concentration versus mind wandering, so using Functional uh, infrared spectroscopy, we observe a strong difference uh, in frontal areas. And we only had frontal areas for this, uh, for this system um, between the periods when they were uh, mind wandering and the period when they were uh, concentrating. And the way we determined that is uh, the number three for which they were correct and the number three for which they were incorrect. So when they were incorrect, they're mind wandering. When they were correct, they're concentrating on the task. Uh, and then we tried also to uh, run some classifiers. Can we detect mind wandering? So this is a huge application. Can you detect mind wandering? You can have applications, not in meditation, it would be great to have a machine that tells you when your mind drifts off, but uh, 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 also in education, it's good to know when the students are paying attention. In uh, safety, it's good to know that the truck driver is not sleeping at the, you know, when he's driving. Uh, Etc. So a huge application, and so one of our goal was also to um, try to build a real-time mind wandering detector using functional infrared spectroscopy, using uh, eye tracking, using EEG, trying to mix all of these together. Uh, and unfortunately, it's very hard to detect mind wandering, even though it can be very significant. All these uh, different stream of data are very noisy, so it's hard to recognize mind wandering in real time. And I don't think there is any system that can recognize mind wandering in real time. For example, here, uh, we're about at 56% accuracy. So 50 is a uh, is, is, uh, chance expectation. So we're a little bit above uh, chance expectation. It is very significant, but uh, you know it's very above chance expectation. And when you Combined signal from EEG, NIRS, etc. I mean, you can get a bit higher. We're not there yet where we can detect mind wandering in uh, real time. Um, this is some of the studies uh, we've been doing with Rael. So uh, we were the lucky directors of the Meditation Research Institute uh, at the foot of the Himalayas in Rishikesh. And they had, this is the research bungalow. And I think in 2005 or so, uh, there is a guru uh, that was uh, called Swami Veda, and he bought a very expensive EEG system, Biosemi 50, 50K, and they didn't know what to do. And so they invited us to uh, do some experiments. We got some grants and did some of uh, some experiments in this bungalow. We had, so this is uh, one of the subjects here. Uh, in the Bangalore meditating, we, we did uh, a, a lot of experiments and I'll show that I use some of these. Uh, the advantage in India is that you have a lot of people meditating and the other advantage is um, not like in, in the West, you know, people meditate two hours, maybe three hours a day. In India, you can get to people who meditate like seven, eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, so this is one of the uh, other experiments I did uh, on, on mind wandering, and this one, it's a different uh, methodology. So I'm going to restart this. But basically, we asked the uh, subject to count their breath. From so this is accelerated here. Count your breath in breath one, out breath one, in breath two, out breath two, and then. Whenever they lose track of the count, we ask them to uh, uh, press a button. And uh, this is what we call a meta-conscious event. They have some awareness of their own uh, uh, thinking process. And also what's, what's nice about this task is it's a purely introspective task. There's no stimulation whatsoever. The subject is just, uh, is just seated and they press a button whenever they feel like it based on whether they remember uh, the count uh, or not. So the instruction is, if you don't, uh, if you don't know what's the next number, press the button. If you have to think very hard, what's the next number, press uh, uh, the button. And this one of the first uh, tasks, this was published uh, more than 10 years ago, of, um, um, of this, this type of study, to study, am I wondering, that's purely introspective. We process the data with uh, um, uh, the software EEG Lab, which uh, I developed and Rael mentioned that. So there's a whole part of my um, uh, career that's dedicated to uh, creating tools to process EEG data. But here I'm just gonna show you some of the results we found on that data. So we take uh, the EEG data. So this is the EEG data then the uh, project it on the scalp and we look at different uh, frequencies. So for example, this uh, might be in the theta frequency band and when it's blue, it means low amplitude. When it's red, it means high amplitude. And we can look uh, at that scalp topography in 2D, two dimension, or we can look in 3D as well. We can project this back on the head of the subject and we can also do some uh, source recognition. And this is what we found basically in this uh, experiment. So we had, I think about uh, close to 30 uh, subjects. And um, here they're pressing the button. This is the 10 second preceding the press of the button. And this is the 10 second following the press of the button. So again, they're pressing the button whenever they feel like, oh, I don't know what's coming next. I don't know what's the next number. I forgot the next number. I was just thinking about something else. So this is when they realize they're thinking about something else. This is their meta-conscious uh, event. And so we can imagine that in the seconds that precedes this button press, they're mind wandering. And in the second that follows this button press, hopefully they're reconcentrated, they're, they're concentrated, uh, they're reconcentrated on, on the task. And uh, what we found, we found some, uh, for example, this is theta. So we found some theta decrease we found some alpha uh, increase, and this theta alpha balance is, is well known in EEG. We also had some uh, uh, interesting scalp uh, topography for uh, these two. And, um, and the other thing we did is we played, So we, we also played some uh, sounds when the person was performing the experiment. And the sounds were beep, beep, boop, beep, 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 boop. So this, these are some oddball sounds. You have some frequent beeps, beep, 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 and some infrequent boops. And uh, the idea is that the boops are starting stimuli and the brain is gonna respond differently when you're in a period of mind wandering compared to uh, uh, a period of uh, focus. So the beeps here happen about every second and they happen throughout, throughout the experiment. So we look at the beep before the button press and the beep after, and we contrast the two. So this is the uh, ERP, so event related potential, to the beeps before, and this is the ERP to the beeps uh, after. And these are, I think these are specifically the uh, oddballs. And this is the scalp topography that corresponds to uh, the presentation of these beats, so mostly frontal. And what we see here is that the brain response is decreased. 
when uh, we are mind wandering. So the uh, interpretation is, uh, you know, mind wandering is some kind of internalization. You become less responsive to uh, outside stimuli. And it's also consistent with the hypothesis along with you know, other experiments in that field that show that mind wandering is a state of uh, low alertness. It's like, it's not drowsiness, uh, but you know, it could be considered like micro sleep. Uh, so the brain becomes less responsive to, uh, yeah. Was this different in meditators versus not meditators, this relationship? Or did there were no meditators yeah, here. Controls. Yeah, all, all controls. This one is about uh, meditators. So that's another uh, one of the experiments. This one we did in India at the research uh, center I showed you. And um, we are just asking meditators and we had 12 expert meditators and 12 non-experts defined based on the number of hours they had meditated. And uh, they're just meditating for uh, um, uh, 30 minutes. And then about every 30 to 90 seconds, they're interrupted. So just the computer plays some sound interrupt and, and the computers ask three questions. Question number one, please rate the depth of your meditation. Question number two, please rate the depth of your mind wandering. And question number three, please rate how tired you are because it's important to know if you're uh, tired or not. And so we had, um, so about, we had about 20 uh, to 30 of these per person. And we define, uh, we studied the period 10 seconds preceding the question with respect to the uh, outcome of the question. For example, we want to know how does the EEG look like when they rate very high their depth of meditation? How the EEG look like when they rate very high the, their mind wandering? What's, what's the difference between these regions before we actually ask the first question? And so what we found first in terms of, uh, uh, we, f we found in terms of uh, the behavior, uh, we found that these are the expert practitioner and the expert practitioner responded they were concentrated on their meditation uh, longer uh, than uh, mind wandering. They responded much more often, I am meditating right now than I'm uh, mind wandering. This wasn't the case for the uh, novice practitioner. Novice practitioner answered they were uh, meditating uh, about as many times as they were uh, answering uh, mind wandering. And these questions are graded, so we just look which one looks which one is higher. And this was highly significant as well. Uh, the take-home message here is that meditators here, based on these subjective reports, spend less time uh, mind wandering than novice practitioner. And that might sound obvious, you're practicing. One of the goal of meditation is to tame the monkey mind. Monkey mind is mind wandering, so you're gonna mind wander less. But this is one of the first experimental demonstration that this is actually the case. And this is not a longitudinal study, so we can't rule out the fact that the subject would self-select here. So the people who mind wander less would just continue meditating and people who mind wander would just like drop meditation. So that's, but there are other studies longitudinal studies where the two people who have never meditated before and train them and there they show that you have very uh, similar effects as well. Uh, this is another uh, um, uh, study uh, we did at this uh, center, this one on meditation. And here we were interested not only in mind wandering, so we had a mind wandering task, but also uh, with Rael in, uh, in about in the about 10 years ago, there was, um, and there still is, a lot of debate what is called meditation. So you would read in literature, oh, meditation shows this, meditation shows that. And very often, these are very different types of meditation. Could be a mantra meditation, could be um, a vipassana meditation, body scan, could be a Zen meditation. Uh, and so we were interested, it's like, is there any common uh, difference between uh, all the types of meditation uh, and controls. Um, here we also had the mind wandering task. We didn't find uh, strong results in the mind wandering task, but we found some strong results in just their baseline 
EEG when they were meditating. So you see here, uh, especially in these high frequency bands, all the mediator groups are higher than uh, uh, the control uh, groups. And they were at about 20 people in each uh, of the groups. So this just uh, was uh, for us a confirmation that um, yeah, all types of meditation seems to influence the brain in a way that is uh, uh, similar, at least with respect to these uh, frequency bands, and probably has to do uh, uh, with uh, attention. Then in terms of uh, uh, meditation, what I was also interested in, meditation and mind wandering, what I was also interested in is uh, people are lazy in the waist. So can you find a way that, to make it easier for them? And uh, so can you use a machine to help them meditate? And, and so I was specifically interested in uh, neurofeedback. Can you use neurofeedback to enhance meditation? And here the goal is not that neurofeedback would replace meditation. Here the goal is that neurofeedback would assist uh, meditation. For example, a person would do their meditation and neurofeedback can help them know if they're paying attention to their meditation or not. So uh, this is what we did. We had a subject, we did some MRI to see if there were structural changes as well. Uh, it was still analyzing the data and then uh, the neurofeedback session is basically a subject here wired and they're looking at the screen and they're trying to influence the color of, uh, of the screen, the color of the square. And the color of the square depends on the frontal midline theta, which is the brainwave of the observed uh, increase in experienced meditators. So we are trying to upregulate the frontal midline theta. And as we are doing that, the color of the, the square changes in real time. It basically becomes darker uh, when they're increasing frontal midnight theta. And they do that over a uh, total of um, eight, eight uh, neurofeedback sessions, so over two weeks. And then we test them before and after. And so this is, uh, this is what we found. First, we found that they were able, so this is the neurofeedback uh, subjects, and these are the control subjects, what we call sham. So the sham, every time you come to the lab, you know, you have the effect of, uh, you bring some, someone to the lab and they think they're doing well, and you know, maybe their brain waves are going to change. So what we did, we also had some sham. They came to the lab, we told them they would get uh, neurofeedback, but they actually didn't. It was controlled, the square color was controlled by the brainwave of someone else, uh, and they didn't know that. And they actually thought they were doing you know, real neurofeedback. They, they thought, oh yeah, I'm controlling the square, no problem. But basically this is this group, and this group showed no uh, change in proton midline theta. And this is the neurofeedback group, which did show uh, a change uh, cross session. They were able to improve uh, neurofeedback. Then we have some cognitive tasks, pre and post. And of course we had some mind wandering tasks. Can neurofeedback help decrease mind wandering? And, uh, and the mind wandering tasks were not significant, but the memory task was, so we had a two back task in which you basically have to try to uh, uh, remember a sequence of letters in rapid succession. And, uh, and you have to make decision, behavioral decision based on the letter which are presented. It can be relatively uh, challenging. What we observed is that people who had the real neurofeedback did better uh, uh, at the end than the people who had uh, uh, the sham. They were faster in, in doing the task. So we, we, our interpretation is they're better at resolving a cognitive conflict. So now I'm gonna move, I'm about halfway. So now I'm gonna move to the part where thoughts come from. And that's where it becomes uh, quite a bit out there. And I wanna start with uh, this, um, this short two minutes uh, um, clip from Mathieu Ricard, uh, which was, uh, this was in Denver. This was a, a conference on uh, mindfulness, mindfulness conference in Denver. And to his right, you have Wolf Singer, who is very respected uh, neuroscientist in Germany, and Evan Thompson, who is a philosopher. 
And it was basically a, a room full of neuroscientists. I think there were like about 600 people to that conference. And so that's, uh, you know, that's what he said about where does he think some thought uh, come from? I want to uh, just give him one example because you know, when I was discussing with my philosopher father, he was a completely unbeliever, agnostic, anything you want. And he was, one of the first thing he took me on was about this really stupid stuff about uh, all what we are, have been talking about. Uh, uh, and so I told him, look, I'll tell you a story and then you make whatever you want out of it. But what I promise you is I'm not telling you lies. <laughs> so, one day I was in my hermitage in Darjeeling, living with my teacher, and I used to come to see him every night for many years to, you know, have teachings and so forth. And then one day I remember when I was a teenager, my uncle was in the seaside, and he, there's a lot of those rats that immigrated from America on ships that were destroying his pond, and he was a hunter, and he told me, why don't you go with a rifle and uh, you know, see if you find some rats. So I, you know, I basically never hunted and didn't fish much, but somehow for some strange reason, I took that rifle and went there. I was 16 years old. So then one of the rat camps and I shot and the rat jumped and I hope still now that I didn't really kill him. It was just surprise, but I don't know. In any case, when I was doing retreat, when I was 20, Plus, and then one day that things came very clear in my mind, and I said, "How could I ever, ever conceive of doing something like that?" You know, speak of lack of empathy. Not even, even imagine what it would be to be just a nice rat swimming there and someone just trying to kill. So unbelievable. So I could not believe that I had done something like that. And I said, "Well, I'm going to tell my teacher a sort of kind of confession." So at five o'clock, I went down from my hermitage, went to see my teacher. That time I didn't speak Tibetan, but his son was interpreting. And as usual, I sort of bowed down three times. And I look at him and he was laughing at me, just earthily laughing and tell, telling something to his son. And when I came by, he said, how many animals did you kill in your life? You know, he never ever asked me about my past, you know, you, my youth, my stories. He knew I was coming, you know, being an ex-scientist who decided to sort of live and receive teaching from him. He never asked me a question about my childhood of any kind. And at that very moment, he asked me that. So, and it looks very simple. It was not like suddenly there was some vibes and strange lights in the room. <laughs> it was just like a gr nice joke, but just give me an explanation. I don't have one. <laughs> um, and you will hear, so, uh, so this was Matthew Ricard, is, is one of the translators for the Dalai Lama. So, um, and you will hear many stories like that from uh, many people. So is it possible to study, uh, to study these, these kind of questions? And also, where, where is the theor theoretical uh, framework? And so that's, um, what, that's what uh, I call, and other people call, big C consciousness. So you have the little C consciousness. The little C consciousness are the neural networks that do all the jobs. And you know, that parse the image and, and, and uh, help you navigate in the world. And there's the big C consciousness, which is the uh, feeling of, uh, of, uh, of being alive, basically. And also maybe can mediate uh, some of these uh, thoughts that Matthew Ricard uh, uh, was talking about. And this touches obviously to the hard problem of consciousness, which I'm sure all of you uh, have heard before. And um, this is a very heated topic. What is the hard problem of consciousness? Is there even, it's even hard to define the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, but uh, basically that's the, uh, idea that we're just more than uh, this uh, machine, you know, this neural network uh, uh, machine. And um, so here I have this little diagram. So uh, this is you, you equal your brain. Yes, so this is materialist, reductionist uh, position. You are, uh, uh, 
you're not equal your brain. So, and then you have consciousness. So you have the neural responses here. And from that emerge uh, uh, consciousness, phenomenal consciousness. So the sense uh, of being and um, is consciousness uh, epiphenomenon. So if it's uh, an epiphenomenon, it means like, okay, consciousness exists, but it can have no causal relationship in the world. It's useless. There's, uh, so, and there, there actually are some studies that show that very often we have the illusion of free will when we don't have uh, necessarily uh, a free will. For example, with split brain patients, they all make up explanation uh, based on context, which have nothing to do with uh, uh, the reality. So they all just make up stories. So very often our brain will make up stories just to uh, make us believe we have uh, uh, free will. So either we don't have free will and basically consciousness is, uh, might exist or not, doesn't make a difference anyway. It's just an epiphenomenon. Or uh, we, there is consciousness can have a, an effect on the world. And so we are more than our uh, brain and consciousness can have a causal uh, effect uh, on the world. Basically. And that's where I stand right here in this box. And again, you know, it's just scientific hypothesis. Can we test this hypothesis? It might very well be this one is true. It might very well be this one is true. And so uh, it's, if consciousness is more than uh, our, our brain, we're more than our brain, you have also two possibilities. Either, uh, you know, it's like consciousness only influence basically the local uh, uh, substrate, you know, it's interacting with, like we can imagine it's only influencing neurons locally or microtubules or so, so it's only interacting locally uh, uh, with the brain, or uh, it can have no local influence. And uh, that's also this part I'm interested in. So no local influence would be to mediate the type of uh, effect that Matthew Ricard reported when he had this telepathy experience uh, with his, uh, his teacher. And the advantage of studying this as well is that, okay, if we can show that's possible, uh, here, you know, it's like if it's just interacting within our brain, it's going to be very extremely hard to study. So this is kind of easier uh, to study, non-local influence. We don't have to go inside the brain. We can just study people like Mathieu Ricard who report this experience, maybe put them in the lab. And also this, you know, this kind of hypothesis, okay, this is very far-fetched, all these, okay, non-local influence, etc. But... Um, I just want to remind you in physics, it's just uh, commonplace, you know, like entanglement in quantum mechanics, you have all these particles uh, acting at distance faster than the speed of light. Uh, so this is commonplace. And it's not to say that consciousness has anything to do with uh, quantum mechanics. It's more to say that even though this doesn't fit our current definition of, of our, your current belief about consciousness, there are weirder things in, in natures as well. So we just need to be reminded that, um, that yeah, it could, could very well be that, uh, you know, our beliefs are, are wrong. Um, so how do we uh, validate, invalidate that hypothesis? So we can use the tools of science and science is, uh, is, is not a belief system. Uh, science is a method and it assumes reproducibility, which might or might not be true. We assume uh, if we redo the same experiments, we're going to find repeatable uh, results. And that's the postulate of science, basically. But it might not be true. It might be things evolve all the time and we can't actually, there is things we can't just predict. And uh, they might not fit in, in science. And then also first uh, person uh, experience which is the easiest way to basically tap into consciousness because we, we know the people who are responding are usually conscious. And so what kind of, of, um, of evidence basically can we, can we find if we're studying uh, this kind of phenomena, like the type of phenomena that uh, Matthew Ricard talked about, uh, this kind of telepathy experiences. So you have anecdotes. 
So that that's, was his report. That's an anecdote. We have tons of anecdotes. And that's the lowest level of evidence. Then we have case study and peon investigation. We have exploratory experiments, planned experiments, pre-registered experiments, independently replicated experiments across several labs, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and finally, uh, application. Uh, if I can build the uh, uh, mental telephone and I make a lot of money with it, well, obviously it's, 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 it's probably real. And uh, we wrote this uh, uh, review at what kind of uh, evidence. So uh, fifth grade of evidence. And, and this is related to how also um, evidence is rated in, in clinical uh, uh, studies. And uh, so basically I want to show you two types of evidence uh, whenever you do an experiment. So uh, this is, for example, a strong type of evidence uh, where you can, um, it's based on objective data samples, retrospective, it's blinded, it's pre-registered, it's replicated by independent research groups, and also it's observable uh, in uh, real time. You can do naturistic observation. So you can see it happen in front of your eyes. But also, you know, it's well controlled scientifically. So that's the highest grade of uh, evidence. And then the low, lowest grade is uh, systematic fraud or obvious and documented uh, flaws in, in, in the study. So show me the evidence. What kind of evidence uh, do we have? Uh, and first, I want to start with the soft stuff, which is, to my, from my perspective, still extremely interesting. Uh, so for example, this is a paper only from 2021 that shows that uh, women's menstrual cycle, menstrual cycle is synchronized with moon phases. We are influenced by the stars. Men as well, but we don't, it's not been studied yet, but uh, here, so, and that's only been shown in 2021 in the robust uh, fashion. Or uh, this other study that shows that our body and uh, brain can feel the magnetic earth. So we thought only pigeon could orient themselves. Uh, throughout the world, but our brain can sense a uh, magnetic field. So we are basically in contact with our planet at all time. And because we are in contact uh, with our planet, and this is again, not, uh, this is not controversial. Uh, these, these studies have been, uh, uh, I don't know if this one was replicated. This was published in Inero. Uh, they had this box where they had all these wires so they could simulate any type of a magnetic field in the box, and they could look how the brain responded with EEG. And they showed that when they changed the magnetic field, basically the brain responded differently. So yeah, it's been, it's been reproduced, I think, here. Um, but because we are uh, basically influenced by uh, the Earth magnetic field, uh, Maybe it's because maybe there's other effects we don't understand, uh, but basically uh, you have, we are influenced by sunspots because sunspots influence the earth magnetic field. Or we are also influenced by solar winds. And this is visible in the heart rate variability uh, of people with a time lag here of about uh, uh, 40 hours. And again, yeah, this, is, this is published in uh, uh, scientific reports. Uh, and this is not so controversial. So we are in constant, our body is not independent of the environment. We're influenced by the magnetic fields. We are influenced by the solar wind or heart rate is influenced by solar winds or, and, uh, and uh, the environment. And we can even imagine that, uh, you know, this could mediate some form of uh, telepathy. Like if there is an incredible solar burst, well, maybe all the, all the humans uh, on the planet will feel something at the same time. And then there is all the mental experience people report to each other. Uh, so this is a survey we did on about 1200 meditators um, in which uh, we ask them different questions. And uh, we ask them, have you ever uh, felt non-physical entities in your awareness, vision or hearing? Have you ever experienced clairvoyance or telepathy? 
a connection with the teacher uh, or, or guru, a direct connection with the teacher and guru. And you see here, so when it's white means never. Uh, when it's here, it means at least once. It can be many times, it can be at least once. And uh, you will see that uh, clairvoyance and telepathy, so the type of uh, experience that Matthew Ricard reported, about half, at least half of the meditators have at least experienced it once. Doesn't mean it's real, it's just what they uh, uh, report. And when I was interested in, in studying uh, this phenomena, I still am, I was, um, I started with uh, mediumship and channeling. And the reason is that uh, it's kind of the low hanging fruit. First, it's the only recognized paranormal job. Uh, second, it's in comparison to psychics, we're going to try to predict the future. Medium are relatively easy to test. The first thing they want to convince you with is that they are in contact with one of your deceased relatives, for example. So they're going to try to give you evidence. And here, uh, the hypothesis is simple. The hypothesis is not that uh, spirits exist. The hypothesis is that there is something anomaly. There is some anomaly, basically, that um, uh, cannot be explained with our um, current understanding. There could be telepathy. You know, the medium is doing telepathy with the subject. They just have access to some information that uh, they shouldn't have access to. And uh, uh, also, um, this involves some emotions such as uh, death of close one. So these are extreme emotions. And if you look at the anecdotes, uh, that's usually when, uh, when these phenomena are uh, observed, like a twin feeling his other twin, you know, broke his arm on the other side of the world, or like Matthew Ricard, you know, the, uh, the death of, of uh, animals. Uh, so these are extreme emotions, and this is uh, conducive to, uh, you know, observing uh, this kind of phenomenon. And then also there was two reputable studies that were uh, published uh, before, uh, one at the University of Arizona and one uh, uh, at the University of West uh, Virginia. So uh, what we did is that we had 12, we did actually three studies. I'm only going to show you one for the sake of time. We had 12 prof professional mediums and 12 controls. We have 200 pictures in, in, each, in uh, three categories. So we had the medium come to the lab. I don't know if I have the demo at that. So, and then we asked them, did this person have a heart attack, car accidents, or death by a uh, firearm? So they were, they were uh, killed. Um, and then we asked them to answer one, two, or three. And let's see 200 of these pictures. One, two, why 200? Because uh, I believe in statistics, you know, with 10 pictures, uh, you can be some ambiguity. If they answer above task uh, uh, expectation in 200 pictures, it's gonna be very significant. So that's why we had a lot of, uh, of pictures. And then we also collected their brainwave and synchronized with the presentation of the stimuli. So, uh, so here you can imagine yourself doing the task and I'm gonna show you three people and one of them died of a heart attack, one of them died of a car accident and one of them died of a firearm. We also had a special procedure uh, to uh, make sure there are not more people smiling uh, in one category than the other, no more males, no more people with glasses, no more females, etc. So all the categories were balanced. So image number one, three possibly death by firearm, heart attack, or car accident. So it's the first person, the second person. and the third person. And uh, once we were on Zoom with 300 people and uh, we tried to do a call, I can't remember the exact outcome. Uh, so, drum rolls. <laughs> okay, so this was the person with a heart attack or a crash and homicide.
How many people here got it right? Yeah, you got one right. So that's the that's the. Uh, it's not done like this. We're in front of a screen, and they basically we have to press one or three buttons. But um, you know, each experiment lasts about thirty minutes. And this is what we found. So basically, there's three categories. So here, uh, uh, this is the percentage of error. Uh, so if you have uh, thirty three percent correct, you're uh, above chance expectation. And what we found is that people were better uh, than chance at P0.02. So we had like all of these uh, um, subjects. We had 24 subjects, 20, uh, 12 were mediums and 12 were controls. And we observed that the odds against chance was one in 41. So this lived, they were able to be responsible for chance expectation, but it wasn't a wild uh, difference. They are not able to respond like 100% of the time. Uh, um, and, and, and also we found that the mediums didn't do better than the controls. In fact, the medium took longer to respond. They have performance anxiety and they did worse than the general population. But then when taken as a whole, uh, we, we did find an effect that we think warranties more investigation of this topic in uh, control conditions. And we also found some, uh, uh, this is the difference medium. Uh, versus control, so we found some uh, brainwave difference, and we we published that in brain and uh, cognition. This is time zero is the resolution of the phase, so we had an early difference about 100 milliseconds, and then a later uh, difference, uh, more uh, parietal, uh, 1D parietal between the 200 and 300 milliseconds. So this is uh, early visual processing and late visual processing. Is the amplitude greater or less? Or? The amplitude, uh, here I don't know the direction. Huh. Yeah, we'll have to look at the, I don't know if the mediums have higher amplitude than the controls. We can look at the amplitude. And we actually have, um, we've done four ex experiments on these topics and um, even though very few people study these topics, this is of wide interest to the community. Uh, some of our papers, you know, this is number two of all red papers. Uh, this was on, on frontiers at the time. So there's a wide interest in the community for this kind of, uh, of uh, study. And it's too bad, you know, it's not, it cannot be funded at the federal level. You just have to uh, rely on private uh, donation to study these uh, questions. There's also this other type of experiment. I have five more minutes, right? Yeah. It took seven it minutes. <laughs> so uh, this is the experimental effect. And, um, and so this is another experiment uh, I did with Martin Schlitz and Donald Ben. So you might remember Donald Ben or, or not, is a professor at Cornell University and uh, about 10 years ago, he was on the New York Times and all the TV shows for uh, um, basically his experiments on retroposition. So people being able to predict the future in psychophysics experiments. And he published uh, this very influential paper in Psychological Bulletin, um, where it had 10 different experiments, psychophysics experiments, where uh, it seemed that um, um, basically the subjects, and he had lots of them, at least 100 in each experiment, were uh, able to basically guess the future. So we did a, a large scale replication. He had 100 people. Uh, I did it with Martin Schlitz and Dalben, and we had about 2,500. So we recruited lab around the world, and uh, we pulled resources, and we collected data on about 2,500 uh, people. We published three papers. And uh, the result was not as clear cut in this experiment. Uh, we, we found that uh, the effect was sometimes there and sometimes not there. Uh, um, and so the conclusion is that maybe we didn't pick uh, the best uh, experiment. We should have picked uh, the porn, <laughs> the porn experiment, 
but it was, uh, uh, from an ethical perspective, it was controversial. So we picked another experiment, but experiments involving uh, uh, erotic pictures uh, tend to provide better results. So maybe we can do it again with uh, erotic pictures. But that's the type of other experiments I do. Whenever there's a result, we try to reproduce it. And um, um, also, uh, yeah, if it had been significant, uh, this would have been uh, basically, you can potentially change uh, part of science showing that these effects are uh, possible. There's some meta, uh, there's some uh, reviews on this. And what we're doing right now is, uh, what I'm doing is this website. Uh, so you can go on it right now, it's called Gotsai. You can do it on your uh, cell phone in which um, I have, um, so that's a, a, a project funded by the BL Foundation in, in which uh, I, so this is one of the most popular website if you want to do games, Psy games. And um, so you register here and then you have one out eight games. You can play eight different games. Card guessing games, for example, you try to guess which card is the next one, or uh, you try to uh, guess which image is gonna show up, etc. And uh, over uh, the years, on our website, there was a previous version of the website. We had about 300,000 people and 300 million trials. So lots of data. On the new website, which we redid, the previous website had problems. So, you know, it's like, wasn't, we did some uh, papers on the previous website, but the new website is much more robust because it's using modern technology that prevents people from cheating. And um, we pre-registered the experiments and uh, uh, basically what, uh, what we were interested in is to test about a thousand people and then take the best one and test them again. So the OB people will be better just by chance, but can the, pe the other people were better uh, can be consistently uh, better or not. So we're still, so what we're looking at the people uh, right here, this is the normal distribution of the population and the people basically were on the outliers. This is the, uh, uh, the bubble game, what we call the bubble, where you try to uh, concentrate and influence some bubbles and the bubbles are controlled by a random number generator, but not uh, the, not a, a random number from your computer, a true random number generator. Now this one is uh, mostly true. Uh, it actually depends on the latency of connection to your computer and, and other uh, factors. So it's based on analog information. It's, 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 uh, it's, these are, so when you're trying to coalesce a circle, you can try to make a circle appear. And uh, we had a location task where you try to guess where a target is gonna appear on the map. And here we found some subjects that were uh, widely better uh, than the uh, very few subjects, uh, that widely better than the population. And um, uh, remote viewing, so you're trying to guess which image is going to show up. And we have a long version where you try to describe on the keyboard the content of the image and we have a short version and again, we have some outliers uh, right here. Uh, we have the card games uh, where you try to make card, take, uh, guess what's the next card and there's three different card games which are uh, uh, indicated here. And there is also a lottery task. So it's like the California lottery. You, you pick your numbers and you're trying to select the numbers. And of course, it's not a, a real lottery. It's a fake lottery. So we draw some numbers and you can't win any money. And we put that in red, otherwise people send us tons of email. Um, but so we selected 100,000 people. These are the thousand people. And uh, I mean, uh, we've retested them. We retested the, uh, uh, some of the best. We, we picked, I think we, we contacted 200 and about uh, 50 accepted to redo it. Uh, we <laughs> them, of course, otherwise people don't do anything. But uh, we sent them a, a, a gift card and they redid it. I don't have the pictures here uh, because I don't have the final analysis, but uh, I did find some of the tasks, especially the remote viewing task, where the effects seem to be uh, uh, robust. And 
for me, you know, this is like, if we can show this is uh, possible, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I like this analogy. This is a, a, a Greek days, you know, for more than 2000 years. And uh, here you have an electric eel. So the Greek knew about electric eel. It just was like a side thing in their life. Nobody really cared about that. But, uh, you know, sometimes you would put, uh, they had bath and, you know, you would put eels just to get some uh, treatment. But they knew the electricity was there already 2,000 years ago, but you know, only today can we fully utilize it. So I feel it's a little bit the same here. You know, these effects might be really, un they might be unreliable, you know, but maybe if we show them uh, they're robust, uh, you know, they can uh, uh, potentially change our lives. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is uh, this price we have. Uh, it's the Linda uh, O'Brien's $100,000 price. Uh, and so we already had one edition, there will be four edition. So that's organized with the Institute of Neuroethic Sciences. And last year we uh, awarded the prize for experiment testing the scientifically, uh, the scientifically, uh, that's not, that's the proper English here. Scientific hypothesis that consciousness is more than an emergent property of the brain. So it's not about doing the experiments. It's just about proposing an experiment, a control experiment What's the best way to actually answer that question? And what's the best way, not in like long theory, et cetera, what's the experimental way? What's the best experiment? And of course, you know, they have to go a little bit in the theory, but basically uh, these, are, these were the free winners, uh, seeing without eyes, uh, you know, there's some uh, people that pretend they can, you know, see with their eyes closed. Uh, conscious agents in the sabbatic world that's from Donald Hoffman University of Irvine, uh, which are uh, how consciousness can emerge from a very simple uh, agents and he has some hypothesis how to test that and uh, deviation uh, trying people trying to influence uh, uh, random uh, systems and there will be a new edition uh, uh, this year although it might have a slightly uh, different format so are we there yet? Uh, absolutely not. We're not there yet. We're just, uh, we're just starting. And um, yeah, I want to thank all my uh, collaborators, one of them being here uh, today. Well, and thank you for your attention.